Welcome back to the introductory series, Getting Started with the Lyra Project. In today's video series, we're going to tackle uh, chapter six, which is adding the new abilities. Uh, and this video is probably going to be quite long. Um, I'll likely break it up into a couple of sub videos to go deeper into some of the concepts because it can become uh, a little bit complex as we start to drive through it. So without further ado, uh, let's jump into adding abilities while leveraging our item definition as the primary method by which we get abilities and how we control it, which abilities are on the UI. So this is very similar to either an action RPG where you have a limited number of abilities active at any given time or a more classic MMO style where you have an ability bar and you can drag abilities onto that ability bar. For this example, I'm just using it within the inventory system, um, but it's a very simple modification to have a separate ability window and perform all the exact same tasks and activities that we're showing in the inventory window. We would just have a different key. That key would open up a different window and then you would perform your various actions uh, in that window. So let's start with uh, a couple of the design goals. One of the things that we're trying to do is maintain modularity. To do that, we need to avoid direct references to other classes so that uh, two major things can happen. One, we don't get into these situations where we're loading all the hard references into memory at the same time. This is good for memory management in that if I have 10 abilities that are all hard linked together, all 10 of those abilities are going to get loaded uh, as soon as you make reference to the first ability. And if that ability then hard links into a bunch of UI elements and a bunch of other game objects, they're all going to get loaded as well. And so very quickly with hard references, you can have a lot of classes being loaded in the memory that you may not need. Um, the second one is when you migrate from project to project, or if you're managing with source control, all the interdependencies, um, you know, it's easy to take a, a, an asset and hit the migrate button and see all of the hard links that are gonna force you to drag other objects with you into a new project. So by maintaining modularity, we get better memory management and we get an easier way to migrate from project to project. The second design goal we wanted to do was fundamentally separate our gameplay abilities from our input experience. And so one of the things with the Lyra Starter Project is there's a fairly hard bond between the actual abilities and the corresponding inputs that trigger those abilities. And so what we wanted to explore is how can we separate those via some sort of a slotting system, which would allow you then to amass uh, different sets of abilities uh, on different characters, potentially uh, grant abilities uh, through the inventory system midway through a level, um, be able to just basically break that apart, right? Support things like action RPGs or MMOs where players' abilities and key mappings uh, are much more dynamic. So we needed to do that. We needed to separate the input keys and the UI from the ability. Um, one note, this did require us to enhance our dependency structure. So as we get deeper into this video, you'll, you'll talk, we'll talk about the UI extension points in the common UI framework. And there's a, uh, a plugin called UI extension. And specifically, there's a, a struct, the UI extension handle uh, that we needed to store and make reference to. And therefore, we had to add the dependency of the UI extension to our project to get access to that, to that handle within the C++. If you're 100% in Blueprint and not in C++, you, you could probably get by without this. Um, there's some magic going on in the background that makes these uh, structs available even without the hard dependencies in Blueprint, but you can't compile in C++ without it. So that's just a little, a little note as we go forward. All right, so let's talk, uh, let's start on the keyboard side of the equation and the input side of the equation. So this is not um, inconsistent with other videos around the primary way you would set up your enhanced input configuration. In the center of the screen, you have your input actions, which are then mapped to a specific input tag. 
Uh, in our uh, design, we have three input actions, one for each of the three slots. If you wanted to have 12 slots, you just replicate this and have 12 individual slots and 12 individual tags. The important part on this is that the input tag triggers an ability on the right hand side. So the yellow arrow says, look, when this input tag is triggered, I need you to go run this ability, which is uh, another generic class called ability slot 010203. Again, if you had 12 slots, you'd need 12 of these entries in the Lyra ability set. So these abilities are triggered when the input is hit and the input is uh, controlled by the input mapping context uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, which is what key in a keyboard configuration do I need to press in order to activate slot 01? So in my example, I just mapped three sequential keys, the T key, the Y key, and the U key to slots one, two, and three. So input is completely slot based. It makes no reference to what ability you're gonna fire, what abilities in what slot. It simply says when you press the appointed key or gamepad controller button, go ahead and fire off the ability slot associated with it. So GA ability slot 01. So before I move on from that, it's probably worthwhile to pull up these very complex abilities. So the ability that they're calling this GA ability slot 01 basically um, has a, a tag associated with it. And that's simply identifying that this particular slot is ability slot 01. So we're using a, a very generic tag that says, hey, we're 01. 01 is based on my base class. So if we go to the base class, which is where the logic is, so one, two, and three are children of ability slot base. And in ability slot base, we get the activate, which is when the key is triggered. So the key is triggered, that activates it. What we first do is we check the player controller and that there is an inventory on that player controller. So we first wanna make sure the player controller has an inventory. If, it's, if it doesn't have an inventory, we're just gonna abort out of the ability. If it does have the inventory, we're grabbing all of the items. Now I will likely cache this later. Um, I don't quite know how expensive this logic is until I get some further testing and we may end up caching some of these uh, some of these calls so we don't have to call them over again. But nonetheless, we grab the inventory items. We, we loop through the inventory items looking for um, fragments, the ability fragments. And we're then comparing, um, if there's no inventory fragment, we just grab the next one. So that should relatively be a light uh, CPU touch. We're just whipping through the items. If there's an ability, if there's no ability fragment, we ignore it. If there is an ability fragment, we, we process further. Then we need to make sure that the slot tag, this slot tag that we had uh, in the ability, so there's a slot tag for one, two, and three. We grab the tag off the ability and we check to make sure that the slot tag is, is the same. Um, if they are the same, we simply fire off um, a gameplay event. So as soon as we find this one, we don't, we actually don't need any of this anymore. That was really funny. So if the slot tag on the fragment is the same as the slot tag of the key I pressed, so i.e. it is slotted in the same slot that, that I'm attempting to do, grab the triggered event off of the inventory fragment and just blast that out there into uh, the broadcast system. So that sends a triggering event. And basically from there, it simply breaks out of that loop and ends. So every time we're pressing a key, this cycle is happening. It's finding the fragment that has the same slot, and then it's executing a, uh, a game play event off of that. So that's how that 
part of the solution is constructed. This is where I want. So I press the T key. It's mapped to the ability slot. That triggers this ability, which runs the code that I just shared with you, which ultimately results in just a broadcast of a specific message from a specific ability, which we've not yet set up in, in the game. All right, so that's the key to an ability slot and firing off an event. Then on the item definition, so in our item definition for our ability, uh, we have our item fragment for the inventory icon, which is what appears on the screen. I've got that collapsed right now. And we have our fragment for the actual ability. We found that we had to have uh, six fields uh, on the ability. One, the actual ability you're going to fire. So this is the um, the real ability, what, what, is, what is executed in game. What input tag, unique input tag, would trigger this unique ability? So in order for me to slide, the input tag ability slide is sent to the actor through the loop we just saw, which then triggers on the gameplay ability slide which triggers that ability to execute. So the fragment has the input tag that triggers the ability to perform. We also have the cooldown widget since each uh, widget on the screen representing an ability um, is unique. And we had to add a, another tag because the input bindings in Lyra by default are hard coded inside a widget class. So we've set up a small subsystem where we can fire off another message to tell the cooldown widget what input bindings it should show uh, on the UI. These last two are internally used in the system. Um, we will not have them visible at the end. They're only here from a debugging perspective. So that's how the item then says, okay, Whenever you, um, whenever this match occurs, this triggering tag, which is we have here in that thing, is then broadcast to the actor, and that triggering tag is received in the ability to actually fire the ability. So relatively straightforward there once we had it all set up. So the UI from our prior video um, had this kind of spaghetti looking uh, select statement where we were um, receiving a tag and then based on that tag we were basically hard selecting any number of the eight different fragments. Um, so what we did is created a fragment payload in C++ that enabled us to pass the actual fragment right from the filter button directly into uh, the grid UI. So this logic became much simpler in that we receive the filter tag, we receive the payload, the payload contains the fragment, we simply set the fragment, refresh the grid. And then the last thing we had to add for the ability system is we determine if this is an ability fragment, we are either gonna hide some UI element or show some UI elements or hide some UI elements. So we simplified this and then added a small piece of code on the end. Um, here, the new dependency was needed for this UI extension handle. So before I jump into the cooldown widget, let's look at how that UI manifests itself. So if I jump into the game, No, I was spawned before this one. And uh, I'm going to pick up this I know has the abilities in it because I've been testing. When I pull up the inventory, uh, functions very similar to or identical to the way it did before, with the exception of when I hit the abilities, I get these three drop zones that appear on the right hand side. So every ability. Every filtered inventory item except the ability 
um, hides these. When I hit the ability, these are shown, and they're going to allow me to drag basically any of the abilities that I have, drop them in this slot, and then they will manifest themselves here uh, with the cooldown widget, and I will have the ability. So in this case, I should now be able to press T and slide. So you saw the slide uh, cooldown triggered in the corner, and then it resets and I can slide again. So let's jump out of that. Let's stay in there for a second. The UI itself. So the items. So in, let's go to the inputs first. The input actions, slot one, two, and three are what we just showed earlier. Uh, no other input actions are set. There are no actions for sliding or any of the other skills. The default information for each of these for example, the slide are all contained here within the fragment. And then this is the slot. You see the slot is filled in now. The ability slot 01 is where I dragged it and dropped it into ability slot 01. So as long as this slot field is filled with ability slot tag, that indicates to the system that this particular ability is in that slot. And then for example, the slotted tag for the meteor ability is blank. It is not slotted anywhere. Therefore, it's not active. The, so that's the how the item is used. For the abilities, each ability has their own uh, set of uh, cooldowns, gameplay effects, etc., cetera, um, which we will go through in a separate supplemental video. We'll talk about each of these three and, and maybe explain a little bit more on how they're constructed. The three ability slots that we referred to as being the virtual pass-through slots are here, all based on this base class. And then the majority of the work is happening inside this drop ability slot, which we're going to come back to, which is what gets fired when we dragged an ability in the inventory over one of those drop zones and let it go. Uh, one thing probably worth mentioning in the overall UI design in why we built the inventory, uh, those are those drop zones. Let's pull up the inventory screen. If you're going to have um, support for something that has a touch screen, the reason these uh, are using the way they are is they're touch sensitive, which means if I wanted to drag an item onto one of them to either drop it, delete it, or assign it to a action slot, you want it big enough that you, with your finger over the icon and now you're dragging it with your finger, you can still see the um, the drop zone behind it. If you made it too small, then when you're trying to drag it over with your finger, we found that you can't see the progress bar filling up um, and you may drop too early and that can become frustrating. So that's why the size of these are the size that they are on the screen. And we'll do some more work on the, on the UI later. But they're, they're really there because of touch screen and being able to drag with your finger on a, on a phone or a tablet. Okay, back to the logic. So once we filter the fragments, we either show or hide those drop zones. With those drop zones enabled, when we drop on it, we fire that drop event. The next part of the system that gets complicated is the cooldown widget. So if you look at the cooldown widget, and maybe let's break it apart and look at the cooldown widget a little bit more. So the standard cooldown widget that is shipped um, with the Lyra project, uh, the grenade is the easiest one to, to pick up and use as kind of the, the base um, example of this. It has two widgets embedded, the action touch button, which is the larger uh, green outline. This is designed that when you press it with your finger on a touch screen, it is the button. And therefore the larger portion of this uh, widget 
the action touch button has an associated action that gets fired when you touch it with a with your finger. So touching this with your finger fires this associated action and it's hard coded. So this won't work for us because we don't want it to fire ability slot 03. We want it to we want it to fire whichever ability slot we happen to be in because we might not be in three. We might be in four, one or two. We're not always in the same ability slot. So this first challenge is on the touch button, which is the direction of you press the button, then this action is performed. In the same way, this duration message is when I receive this message, start the cooldown effect on the on the material. So the associated action on the large button action touch button is when I touch it. And this controls how long this cooldown takes um, when I receive it. The smaller button, the input action widget, which is overlaid on top of the big button, also has an associated input action. However, the purpose of this associated input action is different than the associated action that's on the larger button. This is what letter am I going to display in this square box? Um, and basically these two work together. The data table that's here under input actions is the default if there are no mapped actions for this ability. So this in the code takes precedence over this. This is the default if it doesn't find a mapping. If it does find a mapping to this uh, associate input action, then it will go look up the uh, the button, whether it's a Xbox controller icon. Uh, in my case, with the keyboard and mouse, we've we've gone ahead and added images for all of those keys. Uh, by default, they don't show up, um, and maybe we'll do a side video on that as well. By default, keyboards don't show up in the standard data tables that they ship, but game controllers do. Um, so the cooldown basically has this problem in that we we don't want this hard coded. We want this to be dynamic based on the ability that we put in each slot um, and the key associated with the slot. So there's some there's some complexities there we had to deal with. So let's let's look at how the ability actually gets or how the cooldown even gets on the screen. So it's I, I'm calling it cooldown, but it's both the touch input the visual cue of what key you would need or what button you would need if you were on a controller and the visual cooldown if the ability is running when can i run it again so if you open up the uh, gameplay ability grenade you'll see a block of code that is called uh, on pawn avatar set now this event uh, on pawn avatar set only gets called when an ability is added to a pawn largely through the ability sets, the action sets, uh, the experiences, or the plug-in logic. So there's anywhere you have an ability in either an ability set or an action set, those are going to trigger this event. In our case, we don't, one, we don't have our abilities in the action set because we're not giving the player the ability until they achieve whatever we want them to achieve be that pick it up out of the inventory pick it up out of the world uh, pass a certain point and be granted it etc cetera, etc cetera. so the inventory is what keeps all of our abilities that we have and then when we put them on screen is when we actually want to trigger this type of logic so this this trigger mechanism isn't going to work for us However, this general logic um, does. So what this general logic is saying is, uh, this is just an internal variable. And it says, okay, if this is already valid, it means I have this widget on the screen. So you don't need to add another one. But if it's, if it's not valid, meaning I don't have one on the screen, and I'm locally controlled, then go grab the UI extension system and register a brand new uh, widget. So in this case, the grenade cooldown is registered 
on the UI extension subsystem against this HUD slot extra equipment extension point. So the HUD is divided up into sections, one of those sections being the HUD slot extra equipment sections. And then this says, okay, take this widget, whatever I gave you, and put it in that section. Then when the ability is removed um, from a player, it takes that extension that is, that was, oh, sorry. And then at the end of this, we store it in the extension. Therefore, the next time we come through, it won't try to add a second one. It also says that when we remove it, we can unregister it from the UI extension system and then just set it to null. Right. So that's the standard approach. Again, dependent upon abilities being granted by the, um, the native Lyra system. So in our example, um, when we have an ability in our UI and we want to put it in a slot, we're going to drag it and drop it on one of these drop zones. And that's the point where we want to trigger the logic that says, okay, go ahead and put that button in the HUD slot extra equipment. So this proximate zone in the HUD layout of the Lyra project is designated with that particular tag. So to do that, what we're basically doing, and I'll go in here and show you this in a minute, is where we're firing an event um, in our logic upon drop. So when I drag, I drop, most of our logic is happening at that moment. So drag, drop, a number of things are happening, including the request to add the cooldown to the HUD slot extra equipment um, environment. All right, so I'm going to jump. Well, let me show it to you here first, and I'm going to jump in. So we're going to go into this class because most of the design happens inside this class. Um, and maybe what I'll do is I'll start from the drop zone and, and work our way forward. But there's there's four basic things that we're doing in the drop. The first thing we're doing is we're removing the dropped ability from any existing slots. So for example, slide might be in slot two, and now we're dragging it and putting it in slot one. So we should free up slot two. We shouldn't have two slides side by side. Uh, so we do that, uh, Mac, we just collapse into a macro. We'll show you that macro in a minute. Um, so we remove this current ability from any slot slots that it might be in. The second thing we need to do is if the slot that we're trying to drop on already has an ability, then we need to remove it first. So if there's a slot with an ability in it, we drag slide over top of it, then the original ability is removed and the slide ability is slotted in over top of it. Sorry, it's just removed. Then in either, either case, we always add our ability to the expected slot. And then finally, we are going to override the inputs uh, through another broadcast event to make sure that everything is wired up correctly for any of the inputs. So those are the four basic steps. Let's go into that class. So in, well, we're here, so let's start. Uh, all right, so let's go to the, when we drag an item and drop it on 01, let's do that. So we're gonna go to ability 01 widget. So this is the widget. There's not much to it, simply a visual layer with material on it. And it performs um, a few little actions, not, not overly complex, but we, let's see where we started. That's the actual work. So when we enter with our dragging object, similar to our drop and delete earlier, we're basically playing the animation, which is filling it up with green or filling it up with red. When we um, leave, if we allow ourselves to kind of pull it out of the drop zone, uh, then we're basically reversing those um, animations and emptying the uh, emptying the green or the red. When we drop, which is the action that we want to trigger everything, we first check if the animation is complete. If it is complete, we can continue. If not, we're just going to stop the animation because they went too soon. They dropped 
they remove their finger or they drop the icon prematurely. And so we don't want to actually trigger the event. But if the animation has completed and we got all the way to the top with the green bar, we play our drop animation. And we basically package up a, the, or we pull from the drag and drop operation the inventory instance and fire off update ability slot. This is what triggers our event, which says, okay, let's get the, um, let's get the instance that came along with that. And we're going to make a, a gameplay a payload, basically. We're going to target that against the player state. And that's where the ability system is. So we're going to say, okay, player state, you are going to get um, the ability, or sorry, you're going to get the inventory instance that I dropped, and you're going to get the targeted tag, which I always get messed up in widgets. And that targeted tag is nothing more than a constant of the ability slot 01. So I'm telling, I'm making this payload that says fire off against the player state, send it optionally, the inventory item that I dropped, and this ability slot 01 tag signifying which of the slots I dropped it off. And we then send that gameplay event um, with a specific tag that says, hey, this event just occurred, Here's the payload. And that triggers our gameplay ability, which is called drop ability slot, which is what I just showed you on the screen. So this ability, if I go to event craft, okay, where am I going to start? So the event is activated from the event and the payload shows up when that event is activated. And then if I go to class defaults for you, if we look at the class defaults, this particular ability is triggered on that same tag. So when I drop an ability, I will send the ability inventory ability slot activated, which will initiate this gameplay ability. I'm sorry, just to connect the last dot for people that uh, that the character innately has right here. So innately we give upon launch this ability uh, drop ability slot. Uh, we also give it the ability to execute individual slots. So here's the input tags. And then this one has no input tag, which just means it's gonna get triggered by a different methods. And that kicks off this with the payload data that we set. And we know that we only set two elements in the payload data, right? We set the inventory uh, instance in the optional object, and we set the target tag um, to be the slot that it's dropped on. Now, I'm not thrilled, which is why the comment says that, with the fact that the target tags is an array. Um, and so when I made the, when we made the tag, when we made this target tag here, um, we're passing that in as target tags and the tags is a container, which is an array of tags. So it's not a singular tag. However, there isn't an option here without doing a lot more work to uh, pass a single tag. Um, I didn't want to use the instigator tags. Um, the event tag is going to get overridden by this event tag. So you can't use this tag because this will override it when that step occurs. So you're left with either um, some of these other elements. We chose target tags. And we put a single tag into the target tags. And then upon drop, we're basically breaking that container and getting the first tag, which it works. Um, it's a little hokey. Um, ideally, I'd have a single tag, but nonetheless, it works. So we're casting that um, 
inventory instance so that we have access, right? So it's a standard object. It's a U object that comes through uh, on the message payload. We make it an item instance. If we fail, of course, we'll, we'll do some error checking. We're checking to make sure that we have authority so that this gameplay ability is happening on the server, not on a client. If that is true, we're doing a double check to make sure that this instance that we received is actually an ability. Um, and again, it's a very simple macro. We have these uh, in several places, which just say, get whatever instance I've got, go get the fragment off of it, that the ability fragment, if I found ability fragment, we're good. If I did not find an ability fragment, we're bad. So that's just doing a quick check to say, okay, that is uh, a fragment. For convenience, we're passing the fragment back out of the macro so we don't have to do another cast further down the line. And then we're entering into these four primary um, nodes. So moving the ability from any existing slot is kind of step one. So I've just dropped a new ability on slot one. I don't know at this point if it's also in slot two already. Um, and so what I have to do is go through and say, all right, let's get the, um, let's see if it has a valid UI extension handle, which means let's see if this thing is even on a screen. Because if it's not on a screen, I know it's not, it's not something I have to remove. It's just, it's already, it's not there. So if it's valid, great. Um, so it is on the screen. I know it's on the screen. I'm going to go ahead and unregister it. So I don't, I'm going to basically say, take that cool down touch button off of the screen. And then I'm going to clear the UI extension handle saying, you don't need to remember that anymore. Like clear that out. We don't need to keep a reference to it. Um, I think I got a bug here. I think I need to. I think I need to remove the slot tag uh, in that scenario as well. So um, let me, I'll come back to that. So this basically would say, okay, remove the handle and remove the slot, and that should take it off of the screen, disassociate it from the, the individual slot. Then for the ability that might be in the current slot, we don't know what the ability that might be in the current slot is, but we do know the slot. So in this case, what we're saying is, all right, go get the inventory components, loop through the items, see if any of them have an ability fragment and see if that ability fragment is slotted in the slot we're about to use. So this says, okay, I found the ability that is currently in that slot. And if that's true, I need to clear the slot tag, which is the step that I think I forgot on the other node. I need to take that UI extension handle, and if it's valid, remove it from the screen and clear that handle. So the two fields that I said were internal earlier on an item definition. So if I go to, oops, if I go to an abilities, inputs, items, if I go to the ability definition, these bottom two, slotted tag and UI extension handle, are internal variables being used by the system to track some of this stuff. So here I unregister the UI extension handle, take it off the screen, and then trash the handle, uh, freeing it up from memory. And here I clear the slot tag so that it doesn't appear to be in that slot. All right, back to the event graph. We've now taken care of anything where this ability might be somewhere else or something else might be in this slot. So we now have a free ability and a free slot. We can safely add the ability to the slot, which says, um, go ahead and slot this ability in this tag. Uh, this from the server then gets replicated to the client. Go ahead and get the um, UI extension. And if it's, uh, if it's valid, if it's not valid, which it shouldn't be because we've removed it already. And I'm locally controlled. This is the logic we saw earlier. Grab the UI extension system. Make sure that my cooldown widget class is valid. And then register that in the HUD slot 
extra equipment. And then finally store the handle uh, back on the inventory fragment and exit. So we basically mimic the logic here that says when I'm adding, I want to go ahead and make that appear on the screen. The last step in the equation is overriding the inputs. Um, and I'm going to come right back to this here in a second. But the last step in that is to is to override the inputs for the problem statement that we made earlier. So inside that macro, we have defined the three known slot definitions. This is simply an array, three entries long, one for each slot. We loop through those three slots and we determine, okay, the input action key and the input action row name uh, are these and then the slot tag is here so we say is the slot tag the same did i get the right one of the three that matches whatever i'm working on if that's true i'm going to go ahead and broadcast to tell the corresponding cooldown um, what the input action and the row uh, names need to be so the activation input binding tag tells which cooldown we're targeting with this message and then the payload um, comes across here as the message, which is the input action and the row name. And then on the receiving end, inside the cooldown, we simply listen for the message. And uh, we're listening specifically for the ability slide input message. And we expect an input definition payload. Upon receiving that, we break the payload to grab those elements that we just put in the payload. We take the action touch button and we update its uh, input action to the associated input action. That's the top of the button, the, the bigger portion of it. We then grab the row name, make an array of that and make the input action row equal the default button. And then we ran into this problem. And so the reason I'm putting the video out there is we're 99.9% .9 of the way there. And we ran into the very, very, very last step, which was Epic defined the associated input action on the input action widget as read only, which means I cannot override without either modifying their code or creating a duplicative um, class. I can't change the associated input action. Um, and so what that means is we're just going to have to go take a look at that to figure out that last piece, piece of design. So what will happen is, and this is the broadcast, right? We grab our array of slots. In our case, we have three. Slot one is input slot one and is the action row ability slot 01. In slot two, same thing. In slot three, the same thing. So we grab the one of the three out of this array. We check it against the slot that we're dropping on because each, when we drop, we don't know which slot we're dropping it on, but we are passing that in through the payload. So the payload that comes in is, is the actual slot. If they're the same, that's the one we want to send. So we broadcast on the, uh, on the activation input binding tag, which comes from the item. I know this could be a little confusing. Uh, the item itself has the activation input binding tag, which says on this specific uh, widget, whoever's listening to ability burst inputs, just to connect those dots a little bit more, the Burst ability cooldown is listening for that input. So for the whoever's listening for this input, and I've already got slide done. Good slide. Oh, that is the wrong one. Hold on. That's the actual ability of sliding. 
on the slide cooldown, I'm listening for the corresponding channel expecting the item definition payload. I break the payload, I take the input action, I assign it to my action button, which is this one right here. Then I grab the row name, make an array using the input action widget, which is this one here. This is the one that's read only and I cannot change this. Um, never find this table, here it is. But I can update this um, based on the data table. So the graph is saying, go ahead and replace that table with this entry, that works fine. But here I need to set just like I did over here and, and we can't go any further than that, right? So what does that all look like when it all comes together? So we're gonna play and I'm going to, uh, well, first I'll hit escape. I'll go into options. I'll go into my key bindings and you see I have three abilities. These are my slot one, slot two, and slot three. So I have an ability map to T, I have an ability map to Y, and I have an ability map to U. So right now I have those mappings, but I have nothing uh, slotted, right? So if I press T, it doesn't do anything. Y, U, they don't do anything. So if I go get my, go get my abilities, I now have the fragments. I can go to my abilities and I can slot slide into one. This is where the animation has to complete before I drop. See, so I slide drop. I'm given the slide ability. I can now press T and slide. Y and U don't do anything. Oh, don't have to go back there. Um, I can now decide, okay, I'm gonna put this in, oh, sorry, put this in slot two and put this in slot three. And I have all three of my abilities. So if I do a U, I'm gonna have the U effect. If I do Y, I get my uh, area of effect ability. better um, and it performs the effect oh, I have to try it on this guy okay so we fire our abilities our cooldowns are all triggering the issue that the last step is causing a problem with is if I drag um, into slot two let's drag into slot And then I drag into slot two and drag into slot one. So, all right, so I'm down to T being in just slot one, nothing in slot two or three. If I take this and I put it in slot one, I would expect the image to change, the ability to change, but the button to stay as T because it's slot one. What happens is it goes to U on this visual because I can't change that in the widget. However, if I press T, I'm firing off the ability. So the ability is mapped to slot one, but the visual shows U. So it's door. And now if I press U, I get nothing. So the last bug we need to work out, which is unfortunate, is Okay, what do I do in that case? So now let's put this in slot two, put this in slot three. Again, the letters are inconsistent with what the abilities are actually mapped to because they're mapped to different letters in the system right now. All right, so let's stop there. 
can go back to this back to the slide. So this is our problem. We're going to fix this and we'll post a short video once we actually have that figured out. And just to kind of uh, conclude with where we are on this particular video, we have this uh, read only uh, issue that we have to address so that we can change the letter on the button. And the second issue is that the cooldown sequence on screen is dependent upon the sequence of which you add them to the uh, they add the abilities in the UI. So that means that T is not always going to be in the first slot. It, it will depend on if I dragged and dropped on two, then I dragged and dropped on one. And we don't like that. So we have to come up with a solution where the slots are permanently fixed in sequence, uh, one, two, and three, and that uh, they don't move around based on when we drag and drop them. So that's a, a problem for another day. Uh, but essentially, that is the ability system um, 1.0. Uh, we'll do 2.0 as soon as we've figured out some of those issues. And then for the last uh, two pieces of information, uh, just an object reference map to kind of summarize how the whole system is working. So on the far right, you have your input action and your input action context. Uh, that defines what the key is and what key on your keyboard or controller is pressed to initiate the action. Those are largely static and design time uh, decisions. Uh, on the far right, you have your item fragment with the ability uh, item fragment. So you have your item instance with your fragment, which is the ability fragment, which holds all the abilities that the player currently has, as well as which abilities are in which slots if they are slotted. The actual ability is the effects that happens in the game. The cooldown button is the widget that has the touch button for activation through touchscreen, has the cooldown visualization um, in the material, and has the key mapping at the bottom so that you know which key to press to activate uh, the various abilities. Inside the UI, um, we basically have the assignment in the widget by dragging an item into an assignable location on the screen. When we drop that, it triggers the passive ability uh, called drop ability slot, which is where most of the code that we just showed you uh, exists. It goes through, it removes and adds all the various dynamics, links the systems together, um, and basically makes it so that when I press an input action and fire the uh, ability slot that it knows to go fire a specific ability that is currently slotted in there. So that's a sort of a high level look at the way the pieces are strung together. Um, we are using a lot of tags to keep it modular and componentized so that we can avoid any of the hard coding and we can keep things uh, modular. Um, and so the next one is a bit of an eye chart, um, but it is all the tags that we felt uh, we needed, both for the inventory system and for the ability system so far. So each ability has its own cooldown duration and its own input tags. The input tag is used upon assignment to set up the input bindings. The cooldown duration is designed to have the cooldown move at the appropriate pace. So you could have a one second cooldown or a 10 second cooldown. Uh, the inventory ability slot activation tag is used to trigger uh, the ability when we drop something on a slot. Uh, of course, the inventory drop and the inventory trash are its sister tags that fire whenever we drop on the drop zone or the trash zone. Uh, the ability, the burst ability at the top, the meteor ability and the slide ability are identical. They just have cooldowns and inputs. Then each of the three slots have their own tag as ability slot one, two, and three. Um, the ability types are um, a take on the Lyra projects example. Uh, ability types are primarily what block other abilities from happening uh, while an ability is running. So we didn't really show that. We'll probably spend more time in the actual abilities. But if I go into burst, the uh, 
the, that type tag is set here on the ability. And that basically blocks me from button mashing, sliding, bursting, and everything all at the same time. So the uh, ability types here basically define that. Uh, then we have some crafting ones, which we'll go into once we get to the crafting video. Uh, so I'll skip over that. We have some gameplay cues that are uh, ability specific, such as the actual meteor coming down or the slide effect, any audio cues, etc. cetera. Um, the interact node, which is basic interaction. That's what happens when I press the interact key in the world to, uh, to basically interact with something. Uh, there's the input tags for burst, meteor, and slide. The input tags for slot, one, two, and three. Um, and then the toggle of the inventory window and the very invent various inventory filters and one for the node when we're, uh, when we're getting items from the node. So we saw that in an earlier video where, um, where we mined an individual node. So these nodes over here will respond uh, in a very similar way to that node tag in that they're listening somewhere in here. Uh, not quite how many charges I have. Apologize, set a timer, activate the timer. I probably shouldn't have gone in here. Um, anyway, these nodes respond to the node depleted to basically change the uh, activated mesh to the deactivated mesh. So um, probably a bit of a distraction here, but that last tag is used here that says I have three, so I got one. I got two, when I get the third one, that tag is gonna fire, the node is gonna listen for it, and it's gonna change the mesh uh, to look depleted. So now it's depleted, and then it's basically on a timer that says after a period amount of time, it'll come back to being a, a normally, uh, so I can't, obviously I can't get anything else from that node yet, but eventually that timer will expire. There it is, and then I can come over here and get more, uh, more resources out of it. So that's a little bit of an explanation on the tags. Uh, again, I thought it was good to stop at this point and recap the inventory system as the foundation, the ability system of how we move abilities from inventory into slots, and then how we trigger those abilities in game based on which slots they're currently mapped to. So that's it, I think, for this video. We'll come back around maybe with a couple of supplemental videos talking about each of the individual abilities and maybe explore some of the other aspects. Again, if you're interested in any of this, leave a like or a comment, um, and we'll keep, uh, we'll keep creating videos. Thanks for watching.